Well, Tiffany, thank you so much for doing this interview after such a long five, six weeks with the Vallow trial. Um, your juror number 17. I remember seeing you throughout my time there. Um, and, and just talk about a, a long journey. And I want to know, first off, jury selection, seeing Lori Vallow for the first time, did you have any idea about who she was and the case? Well, when I filled out my questionnaire, I did know, I had mentioned that I knew a little bit about them, about this case, I meant. And when it came time to actually be interviewed by the prosecutor and the defense, Lori was sitting there um, during the, the, the jury um, selection process, and I didn't even know that was Lori. <laughs> so that's how much I didn't know because I didn't even recognize her. I actually thought it was just part of her defense team. So um, that was an interesting thing. I didn't even know it was Lori until the first day of court and they introduced her as Lori. Wow. So, yeah. You didn't know was, anything then. You didn't recognize the face. Um, I didn't recognize her face. I mean, it's probably been three years since I've seen, I just saw a little bit of news coverage and that's about it. And um, they had asked me if I had watched a documentary on Netflix and I had told them no, which I, cause I hadn't. Have you watched anything since or have you oh, just- yeah. Yeah, I, I watched I watched the documentary on Netflix that night when I got home on Friday night. Okay. And and so the so you saw our coverage here in Arizona, um, and I know that that's not that's not really the focus of the trial, but the evidence came in. What did you think of that? Just what did did you you know that it wasn't supposed to be admitted according to the defense? They argued that. What was your take? I think they actually first, the first week, it was a lot about what happened in Arizona. And it was actually confusing to me. I don't know how it was to the other jurors, because I didn't understand how this attempted shooting in Arizona had anything to do with the case. So it was extremely confusing, I think, to start with that. I, I know that they were probably trying to build, you know, the foundation of what they were trying to get at with motive. Uh, but I just, for me, it was kind of a confusing way to start, just not having the, the full story yet. Especially never knowing anything about it. Now I'm sure it's like, okay, this is, all these people are connected to each other and right. it started in Arizona. What did you notice about Lori's body language and demeanor throughout trial? Was that something you focused on? It was. I, I watched her a majority of the time. Um, try not to give her evil glares. But she, at one point, it looked like she was sleeping. She was always had, she always used her hair as a shield. And I'm, I was like, are you seriously sleeping right now during the middle of your trial? Um, that's what it looked like to me. And then she would also use her hair just to shield any t other time that she didn't want us to see any, you know what I mean? That I don't think she had any emotion on her face. And I think she wanted to conceal that. She didn't have any emotion. That's what I felt like. So throughout this, it's kind of like you're getting to know her in some ways in the courtroom. Did you have any urge at all to search for media coverage? If so, did how did you fight that off? It, um, I actually didn't. I really, I know that's probably not believable, but I, I didn't. I really wanted to follow the instructions, you know, given by, to us by the judge and I really wanted to be impartial. I really did. I don't want to watch the media. I don't want to form any opinions and judgments. I really began this and ended this the way I wanted to, to be impartial. There were 60 different witnesses called to the stand. You had to watch and listen to 60 different witnesses. Oh, was there a testimony that stood out to you and by who? I think... Probably the more emotional testimonies that stood out to me was her son, Colby, and her sister, uh, just listening to them talking to her uh, in jail um, and how emotional they were. And I could feel the impact that this has had on their lives. You know, she's destroyed so much around her and just destroyed her relationships with her family. And it just didn't seem like she realized that on the phone. There was just no hint of realizing that with everybody that she's destroyed in this. Before those calls were played, 
were you thinking to yourself, okay, I want to see how Lori reacted to the people that she loves most as they question her about something, you know, terrible. Is that what you are looking for immediately? Yes. Um, when Colby and her sister came into the courtroom, that was actually the one time I did see emotion on her face. So I could, I can clearly see that she, you know, she loves her son. She loves her sister. I, I saw it in her face. Um, but unfortunately I just didn't see that with her other kids or for Tammy or for her being on trial for, you know, murder. She just didn't have show any emotion for any of the rest of it, which was very surprising to me. So let's establish it here right now. If you were in the deliberating room with the final 12, how would you answer the verdict form on all charges? I was going into, if I was one of the ones I got picked um, to, to be going into the deliberation room, I would have found her guilty on most of the charges. I feel that I would have needed to deliberate more on the Tammy Daybell charge. Conspiracy to commit murder. Yes. Well, what was the challenge or what, why would you need more time? What, what did you think of? The defense brought up actually a couple of good points um, that, you know, uh, Tammy was on some medications. Could it possibly be a seizure based on these medications? Cause the side effect to her medication was seizures. So they brought up a very good point about that. And another aspect of it was that they hadn't even changed the death certificate. And it's been how many years and they haven't changed a death certificate to read um, death by asphyxiation. It still says natural causes. And the defense asked, you know, the coroner why. And she's like, oh, well, we were just waiting for this trial to be over. And I just thought that was odd. You know, why, if this was truly a murder and you are honestly believing it is, um, why hasn't the death certificate been changed? So and that's just the topic. That's our, go ahead. That's, that's just a topic that you were willing to deliberate more. You're not saying that you would go with not guilty. You just needed more. You just needed to de deliberate on that more if you were in the room for Tammy. Yes. That's what you're saying. Yeah, um, I was not like set on saying not guilty on that one. I just needed, there was some evidence that also pointed to um, her being guilty of that. I just needed but, to tr probably talk to my jurors more and to see what they thought about the matter and look at our uh, back to our notebooks. Uh, what piece of evidence or exhibit led you to believe Lori Valla was guilty on the charges or not? Or just a piece of evidence that you're like, that's the bombshell evidence that you've seen in this trial. A lot of it was asking, um, talking about her children, building, building up the fact that they had evil spirits in them, building that up to her brother that, that, uh, that would, really stuck out with me calling them dark, you know, constantly having Chad rate what, you know, dark level they were at, um, asking Chad what death percentage they were at, were they at zero yet? She asked that so many times. Um, how many, you know, that, I think it was JJ that she asked that too. Like how many, you know, when, when is he going to be at zero death percentage? And lastly, it was just the money. I mean, it, it looked really like it was a money, conspiracy. She was art. She was planning it. She made sure that Tylee's money or her social security money was being transferred into her account. So it, it, there was a lot of evidence that without my notebook here, I can't recall it all at the point at this point, but that was some stuff that stuck out to me. And I remember watching you all as the most graphic photos of JJ and Tylee were shown to the court. And that was tough, right? I mean, what was that experience like? for you, especially as a mother. That was the most difficult part of this trial. I thought that I would be able to look at it um, and be okay. Uh, matter of fact, they had already shown us some of those pictures before and I barely made it through the first time. And when the, um, the medical examiner got on the stand and started talking about it, I'm like, oh, phew, you know, he's going to just going to talk about it. And then I, the next day, I think it was actually the next morning is when we found out that he wasn't just going to talk about it. We're just going to have to look at the pictures again. And I started crying when they brought in the tissues. Cause I'm like, I knew immediately when they brought in the tissues and, and the plastic bags that they were going to show the pictures. So I started crying before I even looked at the pictures. Cause I didn't wow. revisit that. Wow. 
overall, do you think the prosecution laid out a strong case against her? I do. Um, they took the evidence and, and there was a lot of it, just so much information that I, I imagine that they had to sift through and piece together and put it together in some kind of orderly fashion so that jurors and normal human beings off, you know, that we were, that we would understand it and be able to also piece it together um, based on how, how they structured their, um, their prosecution argument. I mean, really information overload a lot of days. How did you debrief, you know, coming home after all that? I went to the hot springs a lot. Um, just found some just me time when got my nails done. It was really hard because you're not allowed to talk to the other jurors. You're not allowed to talk to family members about it. It's really hard just to ask normal people to keep it all in and not be able to speak about it for five weeks. It was extremely difficult. So you and the jurors fill out your notes. Uh, testimony's done for the day and you go home, you, you don't, there's no deliberation. There's no influence on each other. It's just, all right, see you later. That's pretty much it. We, yeah. I mean, if we, we would go back to the room, obviously when they, we weren't allowed to hear the motions in the court, we have to go back in the room and it was a really tiny room for 18 of us with one bathroom. So we were all just crammed in there for most of the time we would eat lunch together but it was mostly just talk about our, you know, family and friends and just our general lives. So you got to know some people, mm -hmm. made some friends. Yeah. We, we, yeah, we made some good, pretty good friends there. So a lot of really, really good people on that trial that the, they, the lawyers really did a good job picking the jurors on this case. And what were your thoughts about the podcast episode of Lori that got let in with you know, the details of her beliefs. That was really a curveball, I thought. It, I honestly had a hard time listening to the, um, the volume and the speakers in there. So I really, to be honest with you, I didn't pick up a lot on that podcast. Their, their volume system in there was not very good from where I was sitting. I couldn't hear over there in the corner very well. So you just knew it was about her faith and being a warrior and that type of thing. Yes, that's pretty much what I got out of it. What did you think of the defense's closing arguments? I thought they had some good points. Um, I think I think I just mentioned one of the points about you know that Tammy's um, medication might have caused that. Um, I also think that they started pointing the finger maybe at more at Chad. You know that he was manipulating her, and I thought to myself, "Geez, you know that was." That should have come a long time ago. You know, that should have been maybe your defense all along, but I don't know. I'm not an attorney, so I don't know how that goes. I don't know if, if she has the right to tell them what not to say, you know, or what, you know, not pointing fingers at Chad. Did um, any part of you want to see her take the stand and testify? Oh, I would have loved to hear her story. I certainly would have. I, I would love hearing two sides of the story. So that was what was really, really hard we didn't get a chance to hear the other side of the story at all. Nothing. And no witnesses by, no witnesses. The, witness, by the defense. Yeah. Um, I touched on this, but really did more of that evidence from Arizona police agencies make an impact at all on what you thought? I think it did. Yeah. Um, it, it was hard to hear about the crime, um, the crimes in Arizona but not being able to hear about the whole crime. Does that make sense? Um, they were only allowed to give us little bits and pieces and not the whole crime. So for example, later on, when I went home that day after deliberations, I mean, after, you know, the verdict came out and I watched a lot of the, the coverage from Arizona and there was a lot of stuff that I would have liked to have seen, you know, the, the, the footage of, um, Alex Cox sitting, you know, during basically what happened to Charles Vallow. Um, There's a lot of video that I would have loved to have seen. And the interviews um, of Tylee and Lori and, and then, um, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> and then Alex Cox. I would have loved to have seen that. It would have been extremely helpful, I think. You saw Lori's facial expressions on body cam, you know, after the verdict was read that, you know, she really didn't have any emotion. You got to finally see that on your own. Yes, no it, it all just came together for me, being able to see all this, you know, footage from Arizona, how much went down in Arizona. Uh, 
and finally able, I was able to piece together a lot of stuff that was missing from our, from the trial I was on. I, th I think you make a good point. You know, it's, it's known as an Idaho case. It's an Idaho trial, but really you just said it so much happened here, you know, with the roots of this whole story. Um, did you take a lot of notes? Are you a note taker? Are you more of a listener? Um, I took a lot of notes. Um, I did front to back. So it may not have looked like I had a lot of notes, but I had one notebook front to back um, full of notes. And I was had a highlighter just highlighting things that I thought were extremely um, valuable. You know, being a mother, how much did you think of your own kids when your own child, sorry, your, your daughter, uh, who's a teenager, similar age to Tylee Ryan, how, how much did you think of her when you were hearing this evidence? Or did you try to block that out? How was that? Uh, I thought about her every day. And then I also, um, I, I'm a teacher and I teach high school students that are, are Tylee's age. So that was also extremely difficult. It's just a difficult for me to even think how somebody could harm a child the way that she was done such a disservice that the fact that they just didn't have very much evidence for her, you know, it just, I just can't, I still can't. And this is going to affect me for the rest of my life. Thinking about that probably. Yeah. I'm sure you gave a lot of hugs to your daughter and just squeezed her. Tight oh yeah. Because, yeah that's... Every day. She was actually extremely helpful. My daughter never asked me questions. She just came over and would hug me when she saw mom crying. So She's very helpful to, um, to help me get through this. That is, that is really sweet. Um, did it infuriate you even more when the point was constantly made that Lori and Chad were dancing on a beach, getting married, that visual, while you knew with the timeline, her kids were already buried in Chad's backyard. That's to me, that is, she's a monster for, for doing that. Really. It was when I saw those wedding video or the wedding pictures, I was looking directly at Lori. I hope that she could look over at me and see my evil glare because I was, that truly showed what a monster this woman is. Uh, juror number eight told Nate Eaton in his interview, um, Nate Eaton with East Idaho News, that he saw the face of evil in Lori Vallow. Would you agree with that statement? Uh, 100%. 100%. Uh, and now your juror number was randomly picked in the end to be an alternate after sitting through all of that and taking all those notes. Was there some disappointment that, or, or relief knowing that you didn't have to deliberate? What was that like? I think it was a combination of both. Um, I was really hoping that I would get my chance to voice my opinion on the matter because I had been so trying, you know, so good at taking notes and listening and coming up with my own thoughts that I really wanted to finally be able to talk to my fellow jurors about it. So I really felt cheated that I wasn't able to, even though I knew that we were going to, there were six numbers that were going to be picked at the very end, right before deliberations. I was really hoping it wasn't my number. <laughs> but yeah. On the other hand, I was a little worried that maybe the verdict wouldn't have been what I wanted and that I would have to argue it or, you know, and that we would face backlash from the public if it wasn't the verdict that everybody was wanting. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So in a little bit, it was a little nerve wracking because I didn't know what the other jurors, what they thought. I mean, I could see it on their faces, but I didn't know what their thought on the matter was and if they were going to convict her or not. You're definitely emotionally and mentally invested in all of that. And of course, yeah, understandable that you were feeling those feelings. And I'm sure very nerve wracking. And finally, when the verdict was in and everybody was in the courtroom, that must have been um, very, very anxious for you, I assume. It was. And they placed the six of us right behind Lori. So she actually walked right by me. That was the closest I had been to her since the beginning. And I was just, it was, she looked, she looked awful. Like she had been up all night or probably been up for, for, for five weeks straight. She just looked really, really awful. And it was just sitting, being able to sit behind her and just see like right up close. I was, you know, within six feet of her and her facial expression as the verdict was read. Um, 
Yeah, it was just a incredibly interesting and unique experience to be a part of this trial and the you know and the the, the process of it. And again, no remorse or, or emotion really from her when that verdict was read. And after it was, and the jurors left, she she crossed her arms and and that was it. Uh, were you surprised or no? Not really. I mean, she had shown what she had shown the, re- the whole trial is that she seemed just oblivious, uh, oblivious to what was going on around her. I don't even, I don't know. It's just uh, unemotional, oblivious, flippant. I don't know. It just, she was the same during when, when the verdict was read. Lastly, I think, she think... Might have got, I think she might thought she might've gotten off. I don't know. I think she had that in really? her mind. That I do because just based on all the evidence, it sounded like she thought she was above, you know, like a higher power, that she was above everything. Nothing counted for her. As a matter of fact, I think that was something she would always repeat. Nothing, this doesn't count for me. And I think that's what she felt at the very end, too. This is not going to count for me. And mm-hmm. it counted for her. Do you think you will ever personally experience something like this in society ever again for yourself? I... I don't, and I hope not. I think I'm. I think I'm good. <laughs> I think I'm good. Uh, I think I did my my jury service to the country, to our our law system. But I, I'm hoping that this is going to give me a free pass in a couple of the next big trials. <laughs>